I always have the feeling reading Terence Hayes' poetry that his work is delightful. It's astonishing. Um, it will wake you up. Um, it will shake you up. You know, at the end of finishing some of his work, you'll, you'll want to go right back to it. Um, and then, like two weeks later, then, then you wouldn't want to go back to it again. Um, his latest book, How to Be Drawn, uh, is often in conversation with the visual arts, um, which is a part of Mr. Hayes' background. Um, so you probably know that includes the cover design, right? Okay, great. Um, he's also written Muscular Music, Hip Logic, Wind in a Box, and Lighthead, uh, which won the 2010 National Book Award. Um, and some of you know that also last year he was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellow. So that is wonderful. Um, I want us to talk about Terence Hayes' poetry, um, talk about the sonic density, the musicality, um, his ability to delight our ears. Um, I also wanted to write an introduction that would capture how I feel about Terence Hayes' poetry. Um, but I find, as always, that Mr. Hayes has always said it better himself and in his own work. Um, so please join me in welcoming Terence Hayes. Connor? Is it Connor? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Connor. <laughs> Jimmy Connors. All right, y'all. Um, I do like Q and A's. It's true that this book is new, so I, I've been trying to read things that I don't read or haven't read out yet. So that could be terrible, uh, or it could be. I mean, there's things that I know will work, and I'll, I'll try those. But there are also poems that I'm still sort of figuring out. So you know, like in two years, it'll all be. A, a clear set. So that's exciting for me. That might not be exciting for you. But I do like uh, questions. So if you have a really, really pressing question, you don't have to wait for the end. You can raise your hand. And I'll try to get back to the poems. Um, but it's good to be here in the world famous politics and prose. The uh, cab driver said, you must be a politician. <laughs> so, you know, I'm on the other P side, the silent P, politics and prose. <laughs> Poetry. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just going to read from the book. As I said, I, I have like just a few that I know I'll read and then some stuff that if I'm courageous, I'll try. Um, this is the second poem in the book. And there's not that much to say about it. It's called The Deer. Um, Muscadine are in it. So I have this shtick. I'm going to say it like I'm saying it for the first time, but I've said it before. So muscadine are in it. Do y'all know what muscadine yes. are? Not everybody does, like above the Mason Dixon. Yeah, it's like a little kind of sour grape. In the south, they grow along the road. Uh, but in D.C., you probably get them, get them in like Whole Foods or something. Yeah. <laughs> they're free. I mean, they're just, they're just there, like weeds. That's the joke. That Whole Foods kind of sell muscadine. All right, muscadine wine. So, so there's that. I, I feel like that's the only thing. Pataskala is just a town uh, in Ohio. The deer. Outside Pataskala, I saw the deer with the soft white belly. The deer with two eyes as blind as holes. I saw it leap from a bush beside the highway as if a moment before it left, it had been a bush beside the highway and saw how, if I wished it, I could be the deer a creature bony as a branch in spring. And when I closed my eyes, I found the scent of muscadine, the berry my mother plucked Sundays from the roadside where fumes toughened its speckled skin and seeds slept suspended in a mucus thick as the sleep of an embryo. It is the ugliest berry along the road. But chewed, it reminded me of speed, and I saw when I was the deer, that I didn't have to be a deer. I could become a machine with a woman inside it, moving at a speed that leaves a stain on the breeze and on the mus muscadine's flesh, which is almost meat, the sweet pulp a muscadine leaves when it's crushed in the teeth of a deer, or a mother for that matter, or her child, waiting with something like shame to be fed a berry uglier than shame. Though it is not like this for the deer, it is not shame, because the deer is not human. It is only almost human when it looks on the road and leaps, covering at least 30 feet in a blink. The deer I cannot be, the dumb deer, <coughs> dumb and foolish enough to ignore anything that runs but is not alive, 
a trafficking machine filled with a distracted mind and body deadly and durable enough to deconstruct the deer when it leaps, I'm telling you, like someone being chased. I remember a friend told me how, when he was eight or nine, a half-naked woman ran to the car window crying her man was after her with a knife. But his mother locked the doors and sped away. Someone tell him his mother was not a coward. That's what he thinks. Tell him it was because he and his little brother were in the car that she would not let the troubled world inside. It was no one's fault. The mind separated from the body. I could almost see the holes of her eyes, the white fuzz on her tongue, the raised bud soft as a bed of pink seeds, the hole of a mouth stretched wide enough to hold a whole baby inside. I could almost see its eyes at the back of her throat. I could definitely hear its cries. Uh, so don't ask me no questions about that one. <laughs> so what was going on in the deer? That's what I'm going to say. None of your business. Uh, let's see here. Here's, I'll read a few poems from this section. This one, I'm always torn about reading like New York poem outside of New York because it's like, I always feel like people that aren't in New York, when they hear the New York poem, are somehow offended, you know? Like I don't have a DC poem or not a DC poem. But I'm going to read this one uh, just, just because, I guess. So it's just called New York poem. There's not too much to say about it. Although that's what a contronym is. When I say about contronyms, if you don't know the word, it's true. Like a word that means it's opposite, which just completely blows my mind that a word can mean. So you'll see what I mean if you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, New York poem. In New York, from a rooftop in Chinatown, one can see the sci-fi bridges and aisles of buildings where there are more miles of shortcuts and alternative takes than there are Miles Davis alternative takes. <laughs> there is a white girl who looks hijacked with feeling in her glittering jacket and her boots that look made of dinosaur skin. And my friend R is saying to her, I love you, I love you, again and again. On a Chinatown rooftop in New York, anything can happen. <clears throat> Someone says, abattoir is such a pretty word for slaughterhouse. Someone says, mermaids are just fish ladies. I am so fucking vain that I cannot believe anyone is threatened by me. In New York, not everyone is forgiven. Dear New York, Dear girl with a barcode tattooed on the side of your face and everyone writing poems about and inside and outside the subways. Dear people underground in New York, on the sci-fi bridges and aisles of New York, on the rooftops of Chinatown where Miles Davis is pumping in and someone is telling me about contronyms. How cleave and cleave are the same word looking in opposite directions. I now know bolt is to lock and bolt is to run away. That's how I think of New York. Someone jonesing for Grace Jones at the party and someone jonesing for Grace. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, they all have a kind of a different sort of feel up front. Let's see, is there anything in this section that I have not read out in a while? I guess I'll try this one. So here's one. Like I, I don't think I've read it since I've had the book in this form. It's a concept of survival. And it is, it is after a, a visual artist, Jenny Holzer. But she's sort of like a visual text artist. So she likes signs and phrases. So one of the most popular ones is uh, protect me from what I want. And so and this is like, it's been on... Broadway, I think. Do you guys, some people know what I'm talking about? She's sort of like an installation artist. So I just thought it was such a good phrase that if I had a tattoo, it would be like somewhere indiscriminate, you know, on my body, like protect me from what I want, or it sounds like a prayer. So anyway, just on that idea, although the poem is sort of just tangential to how she means it, um, that's the sort of hook that runs through the poem. A concept of survival. It was a good enough request at first written on prophylactic packages, protect me from what I want. The, si the shy genes exploding 
just outside the late streetlights, and later in other quarters, it was found stamped inside all the Midwestern Bibles. Protect me from what I want. Not just in hotels, where sometimes the condoms were sheathed and unsheathed, but in the pews and desks of churches and churchgoers, in nursing homes where the aged lived long enough to find pain shameless. My grandmother's uncle jumped naked on his bed the last time we visited him. Our mood was baffled and ugly, protect me from what I want, appeared on neon signs and banners. It was typed on the ticker tape strips buried in fortune cookies so that opening one after my meal, I looked over my shoulder to a vanishing waitress. I was told her shift was done. I'd fallen in love with her as I always fall in love for anyone taking my orders. Sometimes fortune explodes quietly, protect me from what I want. To be thoroughly drunk and immune to hunger, to dreams, to dream, a means of survival, a bubble of luck. Milk pours from the pastoral holes in the body, or blood when you are beaten, tender in the woods. I want to feel the trees around me. I want you to smell the leaves on my breath. Protect me from what I want. Paranoia is a form of intuition. It carries a flashlight and never sits with its back to an exit. The water always threatens to come indoors. I want to enter someone else's hide and hide. I want to sleep enough to never need sleep again. Too many years have passed since I went dancing, since I cried publicly over so small my mother could lift me with her one free arm from the floor. That's a weird one, too. <laughs> I was thinking as I was going through it. So that's a good part of reading them, you know, because after a while I just know what they all mean. And so this is one of the ones I was thinking, like, will I read this one? I've actually only read this one out once. And so, um, so I, you know, so uh, there's a poem in the book called uh, How to Draw an Invisible Man. I'm just going to answer this question before you ask it. And so, you know, the question of invisibility for black people and uh, how Ralph Ellison means it. So I just got asked this question like yesterday on a radio program. And so I was saying, but in the poem I say, you know, I want to be transparent. I don't want to be invisible. And that the like slight difference in those two terms. I'm only saying that because I'm thinking like, uh, I never read this poem out. And I saw a review where the person was like, I don't understand what's going on in that poem. <laughs> so my transparency is always in that I sometimes see my own reviews around. And then I was thinking, well, you just don't understand it. But I don't understand it either. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll just read a few sections of it. Yeah, I'll just read a few. I'm only going to go for like three hours. We didn't talk about how long. <laughs> uh, who are the tribes? Part of it is I'm, I'm not even sure how to read it. But it's got like a graph in it. This, I guess this will get you to buy the book. So it's got like a, this is based on that Einstein mind puzzle is what I can tell you. Um, and his, his, his puzzle was like who, who, who owned the fish? Do you guys know this? Or something like that. Anyway, uh, the tribe who loves burial versus the tribe who loves being alive. The tribe whose color is pennied versus the tribe whose color is sunset. The tribe whose poisonous touch versus the tribe whose poisonous hunger. The tribe who lives before the past versus the tribe who lives behind the mirror. The tribe who smokes fire versus the tribe who keeps a gun as a pet. Those are beefs, so those are all people who are fighting. I guess I should have said that first. Uh, what's his name? So it's like a bunch of sections. I'm just going to read a few of them. Just to see. Just, to, just, check, just check out for a minute. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Uh, on the tip of my tongue is the name of that blank Mr. Dash, who knew so little of himself, he signed his name with a dash and left his mark on all of us. Among the many reasons to distrust Mr. Dash were, number one, his theatrical grin, two, his chit-chat was a simaculum of syntax, a meticulous mismatch of fuck thisness and fuck thatness. Three, that jacket he claimed he got in a vintage New York store I know his mama found in a thrift store. And four, his overwrought S-curl afro, exclamation point. 
His cackles often emerged blackly enough to suggest he'd swallowed something that should have been too big and rambunctious to fit down his throat. Uh, Bill Reparation. Oh, I'm going I'm to do this one. I think this one's funny. I've never tried this one out before, so it is a blank. So the blank is like BL, and then it's a bunch of dashes, and then it's SS. And so beneath it, it's like a kind of multiple choice. So how would I read that? It's an S. Uh, oh, you know what? I'm going to read the answer key first. So the answer key is, so it's the tribes are, this is way, this is way too complicated. I understand what the person is saying, like, that's way too complicated. What's going on in that poem? I'm glad I put it in the book, but I won't read it again. Um, uh, so the answer key is like, if, so there's five tribes, Bill, Spike, Coyote, Six Four, and Antler. And the poem is like, who are these tribes? So like, if you are a Bill, which is like money, it's blankness. If you are a Spike, it's blandness. If you are a coyote, it's blackness. So you see like BL and then blank and then SS. If you are a 6'4, it's bleakness. It's sort of the eek into the BL and SS. And then if you're an antler, it's black ass. <laughs> and then it's just one sentence and you insert those in it. So the try sentence completion. When I have nothing to think about, I like to think about BL SS, which as you probably know is like thinking of nothing because it was thought of as nothing for many years. So let me give you some examples. When I have nothing to think about, I like to think about blankness, which as you probably know is like thinking of nothing because it was thought of as nothing for many years. But when I like to think, when I like, when I have to think about nothing, I like to think about blackness, which as you probably know is like thinking of nothing because it was thought of as nothing for many years. I'll do one more, the obvious one. When I have nothing to think about, I like to think about the black ass, which, as you probably know, is like thinking of nothing because it was thought of, of nothing for many years. All right, I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to get out of this thing. Uh, it's a tangle. It's a deep tangle. Uh, oh, here's one. So this is like the spike tribe, spike premonition. I don't want to go on no more adventures with Spike, the leader of the spikes, because my good sense tells me he is someone death wants to educate. Cool as marbles of sweat and covered in wows when he walks pretty much anywhere in town. The song he sings he says is a tribute to women. Its translation is baby got back. Psych ain't one of his words, but shut up is. He says shut up when somebody sneeze and everybody obey. The windows shudder, the widows shudder, the winos hallucinate. He appears sometimes at my door like a mythical creature with surprise sprouting from his face. All right. So, yeah, you know, it might be true. Okay, here's a regular poem. <laughs> it might be too much. Um, some poems are only meant to be read and not heard is what I've decided. But this one is like, uh, should be heard. So it's called uh, Black Confederate Ghost Story. And I don't know if this would be true. I don't know if you would have people this crazy in D.C., maybe rural Washington, D.C. <laughs> I don't know if there's such a thing. <laughs> but in, yeah, right? in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, there is a guy who was in the newspaper uh, who loves Confederate stuff. So his truck has like a flag in the bed of it and on the hood of it, like, you know, Deuce of Hazards. And he, wears overalls with pins, and he's got a big sort of, you know, rebel beard, except, as I said, he's from Pittsburgh, and he's a handyman, and one day he came to my house, too, so it's like a poem showed up on the door, and I actually wasn't there, my wife was, and I was like, she's a poet, too, but I decided that I was going to write the poem, um, as opposed to, like, hunting them down and, and killing them, so, <laughs> this is called Black Confederate Ghost Story. Attention... African-American apparitions, hung, burned, or drowned before anyone alive was born, please make a mortifying midnight appearance before the handyman standing on my porch this morning with a beard as wild as Walt Whitman's. Except he is the anti-Whitman, this white man with Confederate pins littering his denim cap and jacket. And by mortify, dear ghost, I mean scare the snot out of him. 
I wish I were as tolerant as Walt Whitman, waltzing across the battlefield like a song covering a cry of distress, but I want to be a storm covering a Confederate parade. The handyman's insistence that there were brigades of black Confederates is as oxymoronic as terms like civil war, free slave. It is the opposite of history. Goodbye plantations doused in Sherman's fire and homely, lonesome women weeping over blue and gray bodies. Goodbye colored ghosts. You could have headed north if there was a south to flee. To flee. In Louisiana, north still begins with Mississippi, as far as I know. East is Texas, west, east is Alabama, west is Texas, and here is this fool telling me there were blacks who fought to preserve slavery. Goodbye slavery. Hello black accomplices and accomplished blacks. Hello Robert E. Lee bobblehead doll on the handyman's dashboard whistling Dixie across our post-racial country. Last night, I watched several hours of television and saw no blacks. NASDAQ, NASCAR, NADA black. I wish there were more ghost stories about lynched Negroes haunting the mobs that lynched them. Do I believe no one among us was alive between 1861 and 1865? I do and I don't. We all have to go somewhere and we are probably already there. I know only one ghost story featuring a brother in Carrollton, Alabama dragged to the center of town in a storm for some crime he didn't commit. As he was hung, lightning struck a window on the courthouse he's been haunting ever since. Attention apparitions, this is a solicitation very much like a prayer. Your presence is requested tonight when this man is polishing his Civil War relics and singing good old rebel soldier to himself. Hello sliding chairs, hello vicious whispering shadows, I'm a reasonable man but I want to be as inexplicable as something hanging a dozen feet in the air. Uh, see, that's a regular one. That's like one you can read out. So Maybe it's half and half. Um, this is the poem that I mentioned is uh, the Invisible Man poem. And there are poems through the book which are, actually these, these poems are in all the books, uh, where I'm just sort of, I start a sentence and I just want to see where it's going to end, and I'm trying not to end it, so I'm just sort of pushing it as far as it can go. So this is one of those kinds of poems, and it's just sort of a, you know, it's almost like a de default writing thing for me. Uh, we could talk about why that is, like what happens when you make a sentence really, really long and you start stretching it out, it sort of becomes kind of musical. And I always try to generally follow the rules of uh, grammar, you know, generally. So this one is How to Draw an Invisible Man. Uh, maybe I'll end up with just these... There's three of these poems, and you know, there's three sections, and there's a poem in each section. So I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do one more that I haven't tried out before, and then I'll just end up with, I think, these three poems. Uh, so anyway, well, we'll see. This is uh, How to Draw an Invisible Man. And then, yeah, Ralph Ellison, we're in a bookstore, so I know y'all know about that. <laughs> And then, when Ralph Ellison's corpse burst open, I discovered his body had been hoarding all these years a luscious slush, a sludge of arterial words, the raw and unsaid pages with their plots and propositions, with their arcs of intention and babbling, with their mumbling streams and false starts and their love and misanthropic thrust, tendons of syntax unraveled from his bones and intestinal cavities, the froth of singing, stinging, stinking ink, Reams of script fraught with the demons, demigods, and demigods of democracy, demographies of vague landscapes, passages describing muddy river bottoms and elaborate protagonists crawling through a foliage greener than money in America before America thought to release anyone from its dream, the waterlogged monologues, one who is unseen speaks, burst suddenly from Ralph Ellison's body, because I mean to live transparently, I am here, bear with me, describing the contents, the fictions envisioned by Emerson and immigrants, the dogmas, aboriginal progeny, scholastic recriminations, dementia, jubilee, hubris in Ralph Ellison, 
Duke Ellington's shadow, a paragraph on the feathered headdress of Marcus Garvey. Some of it was pornography. Some of it alluded to Negroes who believe educating black kids means teaching them to help white people feel comfortable. Some of it outlined the perks of invisibility, how we are obliged to avoid the zoo, the farm animals. It has something to do with captivity. Flayed in the clinical light, the notes printed on the underside of his flesh were reversed but readable, mirrored in the metal of the medical table, and I wanted to print it all properly in a posthumous book in the name of prosperity and proof the genius we believed he'd wasted had been waiting all these years for a simple death sentence to break free. Um, so two more. I'm just going to read two more. I've decided. Because there is another one, which you can just you know read later. Um, uh, how to draw a perfect circle. But that one, I'm already... I'm already hot, so I'll really start sweating if I read that one. So, um, but instead, I will try a poem that may or may not be any good. Um, so this is somewhere in the middle of like, you know, poems that should be heard and poems that should be uh, read. Because it's so, I mean, I guess this is what you could call a conceptual poem. Or maybe they're all conceptual poems. Some people, you have to tell me. Uh, model, prison model. Um, so I'm, I'm, so the model is here on the table. As I said, I'm still trying to figure out how to read these poems. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's good for, uh, good for me. Uh, so the model is here on the table. So like when I'm writing, you know, this part of the challenge when you're in the room by yourself is like, what would you never do? You know, what would you never say? What would you never do? And then to try to do it. So sometimes, you know, like writing this poem, I thought, oh, I, I could never read this thing out because it's, like the other poem, you know, crazy, really. <laughs> Not even difficult, just a little crazy. But the craziness is that, so I'm describing a prison model to you guys. We're all in the room, and I'm telling you how it's going to set up. Where's the cameraman? I told you at one point I was going to be standing in my head. <laughs> um, so, so he's going to have to follow me for this final image. Okay, so uh, here in this small, expertly crafted model, you can see the layout of the prison I will erect. The 17,000 six by eight cells, the wards for dreamers reduced to beggars to my right, the wards for strangers who might be or become enemies to my left. It has taken months of sweat and research to design and assemble this miniature, but with your support, it should only take a year or so to build to functioning size. Let me direct your attentions to the barbed wire fence which thickens to a virtual cyclone of fangs above the prison. With a good model to draw upon, I was able to create a terrific somberness and then lie down and imagine the lives of the prisoners and officers inside. You can just imagine me like looking inside. <laughs> I feel like this is a good time to tell you my parents and first cousin have worked decades as prison guards. Nonetheless, when I, a black male poet, was asked to participate in the construction of this vision, I was surprised. During the uninspired years, I smoked so much I would have set myself aflame had I not been weeping half the time. I am told when my uncle was an inmate, my father often found him cowering in his cell like a folded rag. You will note the imposing guard towers at each corner of the prison. In the yard below, I will loose vigilant dogs. Whether you consider dogs symbols of security or symbols of danger depends on whether you're inside or outside the fence. In our current positions around the model, you and I represent the just, the offended, and the vengeful, the grief-stricken, and not altogether innocent citizens. Take a moment to consider the prayers or insults you might like to shower upon the new inmates as they arrive. Even a slur is a form of welcome. I plan to have the vocalist among the prisoners sing for the old men who die there. Perhaps their songs will soften the picketers. The prison of the picketer, let me remark, is filled with empty riverbeds and the kind of desire that only gets tender in fire. Last night, as I finished fashioning hundreds of paper clips into the shiny bars between us, I imagined myself seated before a parole board spilling indecipherable jive. Everybody is excited by freedom. 
I was reminded of the theory that says the body is a prison wherein the mind resides when I installed the small industrial locks you see bolting the prison's minuscule doorway. In fact, if each of you can bend over now and try moving to the exit while looking between your legs, you will have a sense how difficult it is to escape. So I was like, is that image clear? I didn't know if I was going to have to do it to be <laughs> <laughs> trying to walk while you're like looking right up between your legs. I don't know. I really worked on that image. Anyway, so I, you know, there's, that's like a world premiere, I guess. How'd that go? Is that all right? <laughs> 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 You're just being nice. All right, so this is the last one. Actually, this is going to work out. So this is what happens, because there's another poem that sort of has echoes that I'm not going to read, but I'm going to finish with another of the uh, How to Be Drawn poems. And in fact, this one is also a prison poem. So that's cool. Maybe I will read it again, because you can hear the way these two poems are in conversation. And this one is fairly, uh, fairly just about all the way autobiographical, that's what I would say even with my mother biting the traffic cops. <laughs> or, that's true too. <laughs> How to be drawn to trouble. So thank y'all, this is the last one, and then we can talk. The people I live with are troubled by the way I have been playing Please, Please, Please by James Brown and the famous Flames All Evening. But they won't say. I've got a lot of my mother's music in me. James Brown is no longer a headwind of hot grease and squealing for ladies with leopard-skinned intentions, stoned on horns and money. Once I only knew his feel-good music. While my mother watched Convict's Dream, I was in my bedroom pretending to be his echo. I still love the way he says, please, ten times straight, bending one syllable until it sounds like three. Trouble is one of the ways we discover the complexities of the soul. Once my mother bit the wrist of a traffic cop, but was not locked away because, like him, she was an officer of the state. She was a guard at the prison in which James Brown was briefly imprisoned. There had been broken man-made laws, a car chase melee, a roadblock of troopers in sunblock. I, for one, don't trust the police because they go around looking to eradicate trouble. T-R-O-U, better believe in trouble. Trouble is how we learn what the soul is. James Brown, that brother could spice up any sentence he uttered or was given. His accent made it sound like he was pleading whether he was speaking or singing. A woman can make a man sing. After another of my mother's disappearances, my father left her bags on the porch. My father believes a man should never dance in public. Under no circumstances should a grown man have hair long enough to braid. If I was a black girl, I'd always be mad. I might weep too and break, but think about the good things. My mother and I love James Brown in a cape and sweat like glitter that glows like little bits of gold. In the photo she took with him, he holds her wrist oddly, probably unintentionally covering her scar. There's the trouble of being misunderstood and the trouble of being soul brother number one, soul brother godfather dynamite. Add to that the trouble of shouting, I got to get out, I got to get down, I got to get on up the road. For many years, there was a dancing competition between my mother and father, though rarely did they actually dance. They did not scuffle like drums or cymbals, but like something sluggish and slow to earth. You know how things work when they don't work? I want to think about the good things. The day after the godfather of soul finished signing just that all over everything in the prison, all my mother wanted to talk about were his shoes. For some reason, he had six or seven pairs of Italian leather beneath his bunk suggesting where he'd been, even if for the moment he wasn't going anywhere. Think about how little your feet would touch the ground if you were on your knees pleading two or three times a day. There are theories about freedom, and there is a song that says none of us are free. My mother had gone out Saturday night and came home Sunday, an hour or so before church. 
She punched clean through the porch window when we wouldn't let her in. I can still hear all the love buried under all the noise she made. But sometimes I hear it wrong. It's not James Brown making trouble. It's trouble he's drawn to. Baby, you done me wrong, took my love, and now you're gone. It's trouble he's asking to stay. My father might have said please when my mother was beating the door and then calling to me from the window. I might have heard her say please just before or just after the glass and then the skin along her wrist broke. Please, 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 please. That's how James Brown says it. Please, 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 please. Honey, please don't go. All right, y'all. Going too fast. I felt like I was reading really fast. Uh, Y'all have questions? What I like to say is if you have any questions, I have failed. <laughs> there will be more questions than I, I answered all the questions in the poem. So uh, ask if you feel so, so disturbed. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I read that you said language is always burdened by thought. I'm just trying to get it so I can have it like feelings. Uh -huh. How do you take the thought out? And how do you, I mean, is it technique? Is it words? Sure. Well, you know, music is a great model for yes. that question because yes. we would say, do you always think when you're listening to, mu listening to music? I think you always feel when you're listening to music. So it's some of it like when I think about the long sentence, that maybe is a good example. And I, it's true, I shy away from those poems that I feel like I want you to kind of get a sense of the rhythm and the feeling more than the meaning, often. Um, but then like the Black Confederate ghost story, there's one where you can sort of like sit right down inside the poem and you watch it on. But it's true, when I'm like, again, challenging myself, I am following rhythm, I'm following syntax, I'm following image. But meaning is not first, but feeling is. Feeling is always the thing that drives it. Um, and, you know, like maybe Walt Whitman would, uh, Wallace Stevens would be an example of that too, a poet who sort of, even though it's a colder kind of feeling, but you know the best way to sort of navigate him is to feel your way through it, not to try to figure out what everything needs through it. So I think there are models for that kind of, uh, that kind of poetry. Yeah. Thanks, good question. I have another one. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your name? I'm Martha. Hi, Martha. Yeah, we can just talk. Everybody can listen. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you consider yourself at all a Southern poet, whatever that means. Yeah, I consider myself a black poet too, but it's just because I, I was born black, you know. So I was born Southern. So I feel like whatever I do is Southern because that's where I was born, you know. And on the other side of it, if I'm thinking very conscientiously about it, it would be like, uh, I mean, I know I'm saying it sort of casually, but it would be like Natasha Trethewey, who's a friend and that's doing a reading together. Um, it was even before Lighthead, we did a reading together, and she read, and I thought, oh wow, she's like Southern. <laughs> oh, that's a good subject, I should explore my own Southern identity. But my father was in the military, and so we moved around a lot, and our Southernness in my house manifests itself in terms of speed. So I can sort of talk fast, but I can't, my wife tells me I do a terrible Southern accent when I try to like sound southern. But so with her I thought about it as a kind of a, a subject like what does it mean? But prior to that and even since then I do think that you know it's the way it feels like I just sort of know what blackness is like being, southernness is like being. It's not a beat, it's always like emotion. And so I feel like I'm, I, I'm southern because I am, you know what I mean? So, so theme versus just feeling again, sort of the same, same response. Thank you. Thank you. But I like Southerners. I think Southerners tell great stories. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Um, speaking of music, I know you know that you've talked about it in interviews, and everybody who's read your work can hear the music. And I was wondering if you've ever thought about doing any kind of collaborative project that would actually include music, if it was a piece of it, or if it's enough for you to have um, words as music, or if you've so ever I, thought about it. I can tell like dropped opportunities in my general 
my general <coughs> sense is that I, I do want the language to work. So in the times in the past when I've done things with bands, I always feel like they're sort of, like if the language is heavy enough, you actually don't want any other distractions. You want to be able to hear it. Um, and so even connected to like wanting to have the book when I performed with uh, rappers, guys growing up, I would have um, my paper because I was always suggesting that I want people to know that it's, it's written, you know, not memorized. And I also don't want them to think about me. I want them to think about the poem. So I just sort of, I don't really want to get in the way of the poem. And I think sometimes music can get in the way of the poem. Although I, I like, you know, I've heard really good renditions of, uh, music and I've done a few pieces with it, but as a general policy, I'm trying to get it. It's like drumming on top of drums or something. Like I'm trying to get it to be its own, its own drum. So the side story is that uh, last time I read in L.A., a woman came up and she was like, "You're wonderful. You know, I'm a I'm a, uh, a lawyer at some big agency where uh, who did she say? Kendrick Lamar and Michelle and Dave Gilcello. She said a whole bunch of names." And she was like, I want to put you in touch with these people. I think you're brilliant. And I was like, well, I want to meet them. I don't want to work with them. <laughs> like, maybe if me and Kendrick sat and like, wrote a song together, I guess that could be interesting. But, but I just was not interested. And I, you know, she was like, it was an opportunity, quote unquote. But that's just not what I do. Like, I, I'm not a songwriter. I, don't, I think that it's too dense to be anything but its own kind of music. You know what I mean? Plus, I can't do it. I mean, it would, I would have to burn. How to do it. So, but I was flattered, you know. So, yeah, I hope the, the poems are carrying their own music. Besides Wallace Stevens that you mentioned, are there people that you admire, like, for their musical quality or for the sort of sonic density of their work? Um, yeah, I would say that generally the poems that I like are doing that. Uh, Yusuf Komenyaka. Uh, I, I do think more about poems and poets and poetry. So, like, Keats to Autumn, Season of Mist and Mellow Fruitfulness, you know, Wholesome Buzzing of the sun conspiring with you anyway so you know like there's certain um, poems that I think of are like just full of music so that would be one um, so yeah I'll just say yes in general uh, anybody that has any kind of real music whether it's syntactical you know image wise is good Bob Kaufman is great I mean I could sort of run them off you know as I said I just you know brought up Wallace Stevens sort of randomly but um, I, I like a lot of stuff is what I would say. I mean, the question would be like, who don't I like? That would be a <laughs> more difficult question. Who don't you like? <laughs> uh, I've never That's been super crazy about like uh, T.S. Eliot. I don't think of him as super musical. Other than like the, lo again, love song for J. Alfred Prufrock. That's good, but he wrote that at the beginning. <laughs> I was never like uh, super crazy about um, Langston Hughes. Even in high school, I never thought of him as super, super musical. Even though he was writing about the blues, he was never. But Gene Toomer, I, I had sort of, you know, this is before people taught me what to like. And I've <laughs> since found really good poems by Langston Hughes. But just sort of walking in the door with the run of the mill Langston Hughes, he wasn't. I was always embarrassed to say that to people, but I was always like, eh, you know, just don't care. <laughs> so, yeah, so I wouldn't put him in the don't like category. But when I, you know, entering the house of poetry, that was like, you know, I think I'm looking for something else. It was sort of my first impression. So, yeah. yeah, hi. Uh, hi. One of the, the poets that you uh, have in your collection, or there's a poem about his as which night. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Was he uh, an influence on your work? And and could you tell us a little bit about the writing of that, uh, that poem? Sure, yeah. Well, I've been working on essays about as which night for, well, really for about 12 years. And then in, in this semester, I've been going around giving talks about him. But the, the quick anecdote is uh, when I was in college and I wasn't majoring in art and I was a basketball player and a, a visual artist, a poet came. So he was the first poet I ever met. My English teacher made me sit in the office with him and we talked and he asked me what I liked. And I, I had read Ethridge Knight's idea of ancestry. So I was like, I like that poem. And if you heard like tangentially, I was interested because he was a prison poet and I grew up surrounded by, you know, prisoners and prison guards. So that sort of stuff, again, when I'm just reading before I know what to read is how I would say that, before I've taken any classes, this is the moment where I'm sort of going past Hughes and past Eliot, but like, oh, this is interesting, you know, Tumor is interesting, Whittlin Brooks is interesting, Etheridge Knight was super interesting. So I just said to the dude, I like Etheridge Knight, and he said to me, I know Etheridge Knight, you know, we're good friends, you should come to uh, Indiana and meet him. 
and then I, I said I would, and then when the time came, I was like, man, I don't know this white dude. I'm like, I'm from <laughs> Indiana. So I was like, oh, you know, maybe over the summer. Um, so I didn't do it, and then after it's passed away. So that's really like my defining moment, like as a poet, to think about that missed opportunity, and then also about you know his work more deeply. So in every other book, and it just, I only realized this with this book. I wasn't doing it on purpose, but my first book has a Etheridge Knight poem in it, the very first one, and then the uh, third one, Wind in the Box, has a poem called The Blue Etheridge, and then this one has a poem about him in it. So he's always sort of floating, you know, around. And then sort of the teacherly comment I would make about him is just because he was a poet who did a whole bunch of stuff. He was a blues poet, he was a prison poet, he was a southern poet, he was a uh, erotic poet, he was a political poet, uh, he was a beauty poet. So there's, he, when you look at his body of work, it's not like he's got that many great poems, yeah. but when you put the best poems together, you see him trying a whole bunch of stuff. So I don't know which came first, if I was already like that and that he made me, he was interesting to me because I was always like that or I'm like that because I saw that that's what he was doing. I mean, that's how long I've been reading it. So thank you.